Hi everyone. Today I'd like to talk to you about Newton's first law of motion. Our objectives are going to be to define force, to define mass and inertia and understand what's the same and different about them, and finally to really explain the meaning of Newton's first law of motion. So to begin with, Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest is going to remain at rest, and an object in motion will remain in motion at a constant velocity and in a straight line unless they're acted upon by a net force. You've probably heard something similar to that before, but there are a couple really subtle details that are very important in this definition. And by the way, Newton's first law of motion is also known as the law of inertia. So what's it mean? Let's start out by defining a force. A force is a push or a pull on an object. And we measure the units of force in Newton, named after Isaac Newton, of course. One Newton is one kilogram times a meter per second squared. So it's not a fundamental unit, it's a derived unit made up of a combination of other fundamental units. How much really is a Newton? Well, if you hold in your hand a medium-sized apple, the force of gravity, the weight of that apple in your hand, is roughly equivalent to one Newton. So then what is a net force? Well, a net force is just the vector sum of all the forces acting on an object. That sounds much more complicated than it is. If I have a drink sitting on a table, I have the force of gravity pulling the drink down, and I also have the table pushing back on the drink. The forces exactly match each other so that that object has no net force. If it has a weight of 10 newtons down, the table is pushing back on it with 10 newtons. The net force, the sum of those two 10 newton forces in opposite directions, is zero. That means no net force. So if all the forces are balanced, there is no net force, an object will stay in its current state of motion. If it's being still, it will stay still. If it's moving at a speed of 5 meters per second that way, it will keep moving at 5 meters per second that way forever and ever and ever until a net force acts upon it. So any unbalanced force is a net force. But what does that really mean? It means an object wants to keep doing what it's doing, and it'll keep doing that until an unbalanced force acts upon it. And this is really tough to see in today's world here on Earth. It's a simple concept, but it's so counterintuitive to what we see every day that sometimes it can be a little bit tricky. <clears throat> to break it down, let's start with an object at rest. These are pretty straightforward. If Mittens, our cat, is at rest on the couch, Mittens is going to stay at rest unless a net force acts upon her. If you happen to go push Mittens off the couch, you are applying a net force, Mittens will move. But otherwise, she's just going to stay there forever and ever and ever until an unbalanced force acts. That part's pretty straightforward. Objects in motion, however, this one's a little bit tougher to see. They will remain in motion at constant velocity unless acted upon by a net force. Imagine you take a textbook and you slide it across your desk. Why does it slow down and stop? there must be an unbalanced or a net force on it. The force of friction is what's going to slow it down. And because we have friction here on Earth, it's awfully difficult to see this in its natural state. We need to find a very, very low friction surface, or another way to think about it, what would happen if you were in space? If you threw a baseball in outer space, it would theoretically just keep going and going and going because there are no net forces on it. There's no friction, there's no air resistance, and if we keep it far away enough from any planet so that we can neglect gravity, it will just keep going and going and going at a constant speed in a straight line forever and ever and ever. That's what Newton's first law is telling us. Here on Earth, the situation of an op object moving where it has no net force is extremely, extremely rare doesn't happen. Even your car, if you have, you're going down the street 60 miles per hour, if you take your foot off the gas and you just let it coast, even if you don't touch the brakes, eventually, if you're going down a flat road, your car will come to rest due to friction. So we can't see this very easily here on Earth. Static equilibrium is what we call the situation where the net force on an object is zero. <clears throat> Here, if we have a Sunday sitting on a table, the Sunday is not going to move. It has some force of gravity, which we can call Fg, or sometimes we call the force of gravity weight, 
And later on, we're just going to abbreviate the force of gravity. We're going to write it as mg. The mass times the gravitational field intensity, the gravitational field strength, g, at 9.8 meters per second squared. And something must be pushing up on it, too, the force of the table it's sitting on, which we'll later label the normal force, the force from the table up on it. As long as those two exactly match, the net force on it is zero. We call that static equilibrium. And we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about Newton's second law. So inertia, what's this word? Well, inertia is really the tendency of an object to resist a change in velocity, to resist an acceleration. Change in velocity is acceleration. An object's resistance to being accelerated. If I have in front of me a candy cane and a giant train, which one has more inertia? The giant train. I can push as hard as I want and hardly give it any acceleration. Just a flick of my finger on the candy cane and it will accelerate very rapidly. Now, mass has two aspects. Inertial mass is how hard it is to change an object's velocity, <clears throat> how hard it is to accelerate that object. Gravitational mass is how strongly a gravitational field affects that mass. What's really nifty in physics is any time anywhere we've ever tried to measure inertial mass and gravitational mass, they always turn out to be the same. So inertial mass, gravitational mass are different ways of looking at something, but they always turn out to be the same. So the distinction makes our lives a whole lot simpler. Because once we know that, we can say, for the purposes at least of introductory physics, that mass and inertia are synonymous. They mean the same thing. We can replace one with the other. So let's look at a sample problem here. Which object has the greatest inertia? A falling leaf, a softball in flight, a seated high school student, or a toy balloon? Well, if you don't like that problem, cross off the word inertia and write in mass. Which object has the greatest mass? Well, now that just became easy. Of course, it must be the high school student. Let's look at another one. Which object has the greatest inertia? A 5 kilogram mass moving at 10 meters per second, a 10 kilogram mass moving at 1 meter per second, a 15 kilogram mass moving at 10 meters per second, or a 20 kilogram mass moving at 1 meter per second? Again, this is a trick question. If I cross off inertia and replace that word with mass, it's pretty obvious that that has the greatest mass, therefore it has the greatest inertia. For the purposes of this course, inertia and mass are synonymous. Hope that gets you a good start on Newton's first law of motion. We'll be back with Newton's second law very shortly and find out that Newton's first law is actually a subset of the second law. Have a great day.